Welcome to the Air Gun Show. This week we've got a compact PAO scope from the shooting party on test. But before that, I'm heading out on a summertime squirrel cull. I'm out after squirrels today. Now, I shoot these woods fairly frequently. We featured them on the show before. There's no commercial shooting here. They're managed for firewood, timber, uh, and also for conservation. Now, there's hazel coppice here, so that's used to produce charcoal. Uh, they're also big standard trees, ash, oak, um, and other species that are used for saw logs. Now, the problem, obviously, that grey squirrels are causing here is they're chewing, they're bark stripping, and it's causing the trees to deform. Now these woods are quite away from where I live, so fortunately the landowner runs feeders, keeps them topped up, saves me having to travel back and forth. Once he thinks they're getting regular visits from squirrels, I come out and have a go. Now he's called me, he's recently moved a feeder, since then it appears to be getting a lot of attention from squirrels. So we're going to go have a look at it now, have a bit of a recce there, there, and think about where to set up a hide and maybe come back and target it again. Right, let's go and have a look. It's a very hot day, and I wouldn't expect to see much out and about in the open fields when the weather's like this. But I'm hopeful that there should be a few squirrels moving in the cool shade of the woods. A couple of brief sightings on the way in confirmed that squirrels are on the move, so I'm going to tuck myself into a shady spot and see if I can capitalise on the situation. Right, well, although the plan was initially to come and set up a hide, we've seen a few squirrels moving literally while we've been walking around and when we've arrived at the feeder. So I think rather than waste time building the hide now, I'm gonna settle in for a while, see if they will come back to the feeder and see if we can get some early shots. I may not be building a hide, but the head net is still going on. It's a quick and easy way to make myself less conspicuous when settling in for an ambush. Another item of kit I'm going to be taking advantage of is my shooting sticks. I've got them with me so I just as well make the most of them. They make for extremely accurate shooting from a sitting position. Now that I'm settled in we just need to keep as still and quiet as possible. The aim is to convince the squirrels that the disturbance has passed and it's safe to venture back out to feed. And we don't have to wait very long at all before the first squirrel of the session shows up. Well, that was a quicker start than I'd expected. They're obviously well on to this feeder. I did actually think for a moment that our first one was going to end up stuck in the feed tray, 
but a couple of kicks it's flopped out and it's fallen into the stream so we don't need to worry about it discouraging any others and uh, fingers crossed we will get some more chances from here. It's so much more comfortable in the shade of the woods than out in the open today. I keep my eyes peeled for signs of incoming squirrels and it's not long before a second one clambers down to raid the feeder. Well, that was, that was frustrating, but at least I managed to finish it off with the second shot. Now, I'm not quite sure what happened with the first shot. I was aiming for the head. I fear I may have missed a little bit high, hit it in the back at that angle, which probably still got the pellet through to its heart and lungs, but it had enough strength to clamber back round to the side of the tree. It looked like it was expiring by then, to be honest, because it was losing its grip on the bark, but I put another pellet into it and it's fallen onto the deck, stone dead. So. That's our second squirrel of the session, thanks to that follow-up shot and uh, courtesy of the quick reloading with the multi-shot gun. Well, we've had a couple of squirrels shy away. It's looked like they've, come, they've been coming to the feeder, but they've backed off before I've had a chance to take a shot. They've obviously rumbled the fact that we're here. Now, I'm not sure whether it's because I'm sat out in the open like this or because we're just a little bit too close to the feeder. But I've got my hide building kit here. There's what looks like probably being a more appropriate site just a bit further along the bank here. So I'm going to set up there um, and hopefully it won't cause too much disturbance and we'll settle in again and try and bag a few more. Right, well I'm in position in the hide now and it is really a very simple net hide. Just a couple of hide poles with the net draped on it. I've not messed about dressing it. Um, the biggest change is I've just backed a little bit further away from the feeder, slightly different angle, but most significantly, I've tucked myself right into the bank behind me here. So I've got a nice solid backdrop. So we're not gonna be silhouetted to anything looking back up here. Now, after the disturbance of setting up the hide, I don't think it's gonna to hurt too much to chat about the kit now. I know a lot of you like to hear about the setup. So, um, I've got the Daystate Red Wolf, which I actually had for review, and we reviewed it on the show um, one or two episodes back. A fantastic gun, I absolutely love it. Daystate haven't asked me back for it yet, so I couldn't resist taking it out for a hunting session. Um, obviously it's Daystate's electronic internals, very consistent gun. Um, I've topped it with an MTC Mamba light scope. Um, again, really like these scopes. Most of all, I like the low turrets, so when I'm using night vision kit or a lamp, it doesn't get in the way for that. But generally, just really good optics and a relatively compact scope too. Back to the gun very quickly. It's sub 12 foot pound, 2.2 caliber, which at this sort of range, the feeder's not much more than 20, 25 meters away. Really straightforward shots. Legal limits, absolutely perfect for it. So I'm gonna to try to be quiet now and hopefully we'll get a chance to put it to use. Another visitor drops in shortly after the hide went up, but it's not what we're after today. Well, that was a Jay and it's a, uh... It's good to see wary birds like corvids coming into the feeder because it means we obviously haven't caused too much disturbance, which is encouraging. Now, I chose not to shoot it. We've discussed it with the landowner here and we've decided not to control jays at the moment because they're not particularly abundant here. So it's nice to see a few. Um, we are controlling magpies and we're controlling crows and we'll keep an eye on the jays. Now, on other places where I shoot, if J numbers are quite high, we will take a few out because frankly they cause the same problems as magpies, chiefly taking eggs and chicks from other birds' nests. So if there are so many Js that they're causing problems, regardless of the fact that they are very handsome birds, 
I've got no reservations about keeping their numbers down when it needs to be done. That J may not have been on today's quarry list, but grey squirrels certainly are, and there's never any let up when dealing with these invasive pests. Well that's what you want, lovely clean headshot. That one didn't even make it to the feed tray. The squirrels are clearly well onto this feeding station. This one has turned up very quickly after the last shot and makes the mistake of hanging around on top of the feeder. Well, that one seemed a bit fidgety, but I don't think it was in the least bit aware of us. Um, it was just a little bit cagey around the feeder. But again, another one that didn't even make it to the feed tray smacked it from the top of the feed hopper, another really good clean headshot. It's a bit more of a wait this time, but it's still not very long before the next bushy-tailed diner calls in at the feeder. Well now we really have got one stuck in the feed tray. They'll often kick their way out as they kick a little bit as they're expiring, but that one was such a clean kill. It's just stuck there now amongst the maize. Now I'm not going to mess about breaking cover to get it out from there. I'm going to leave it there and we'll see how the others react to it. Having a dead squirrel stuck in the feeder is not ideal, but it doesn't usually discourage others from calling in. This next visitor certainly proves that point. This squirrel is a little reluctant to keep still, but it doesn't seem to be overly bothered by the fact that we've got a dead one in the feed tray. Well, it looked for a moment like we were going to have another one stuck in the feeder then, but that one has just kicked its way out, flopped down onto the deck beneath the feeder. Now, I lingered for a little while on that shot, just really to see how it was going to react um, around the other one that was dead in the tray. And the answer to that was it really hardly seemed to care at all. Certainly didn't seem to be discouraged by it, so I think it is just as well that I didn't cause any disturbance going out and moving it from the tray. Like time's wearing on a bit, but we'll, um, we'll sit it out for a bit longer, see if we can't add to the bag. After a hectic start, the final hour proves to be a slow one. The hot conditions seem to have taken their toll. Right, well, we've had nothing visit the feeder for quite a while now, and I'm not at all surprised. It's got very hot, and I just don't expect squirrels to be moving in the heat of the day like this. They're probably holed up somewhere in the shade, keeping well out of it. So it's gone well enough. We're going to quit while we're ahead, but the feeder's going to remain in situ. It's going to remain topped up, and I'm going to keep coming back until the squirrels stop visiting it. Feeding station tactics proving their worth again there, and now it's the Air Gun Show News. This is the Air Gun Show News. Shooting could be included in the next Commonwealth Games after all. A government minister confirmed that politicians are exploring the potential of including the shooting sports in Birmingham 2022. 
Shooting is an optional sport in the Commonwealth Games, though it has been featured in every single one since 1974, until the Birmingham team left shooting off its provisional list of sports. The final decision on whether to reinstate shooting rests with the Commonwealth Games Federation. If you're an FAC air gunner, you're in good company. The latest figures reveal that firearm certificates have risen by 2% and are now at their highest level in 30 years. Now, more than 157,000 people in the UK have a firearms licence. A Basque spokesman said that the more people who take part in shooting sports, the louder our voice and the better our position for promoting the sport becomes. Staying with Basque, Peter Glenzer has been re-elected as the association's chairman. A specialist firearms barrister, Mr Glenzer was on Basque Council for eight years before taking up the chairman's role last year. He's been part of a team that restored stability to Basque after a string of high-profile departures. Basque's vice chairman and executive committee chairman have also been re-elected. And finally, don't miss the new issue of Egg and Shooter magazine, out now. It's a gear special packed with all the latest guns, clothing and accessories to make your summer shooting a success. There's a head-to-head review of two lightweight guns and a budget bullpup. Plus, there's a buyer's guide to finding the all-round rifle for you. Pick up Egg and Shooter in newsagents or subscribe at myfavouritemagazines.co.uk That was the Egg and Show News. I'm looking at another PAO Emerald SWAT scope this week. Now, I've reviewed a few of these over recent months and used one in a very recent hunting package. And I have to say that for the money, I'm really impressed with these optics. This model is the Mildot IR 3 to 12 by 44 compact. Distributed by the shooting party, it has a retail price of £149.99. I'd class that as a mid-priced air gun scope, and it's a very comprehensive package which includes two-piece mounts, an oversized parallax wheel, and flip-up lens covers. This is a tough little scope. Made from high-quality aircraft-grade aluminium, it feels really solidly built. It's shockproof, so you've got no worries if you want to use it with a recoiling air gun. It's also nitrogen purged, so it's fog proof and waterproof and won't mist up if you get caught out in a shower. One feature I also really like is the cowl over the objective lens, which acts as a sunshade. Without the supplied scope mounts and other accessories, the compact weighs 670 grams and is just 28 centimeters long. Those compact proportions help to keep weight down and also prevent your combo from looking and feeling too top heavy. One thing that is big about this scope is its 30mm tube. That really helps to suck the light in during dawn and dusk sessions and when lamping. The combination of that oversized tube and good quality multi-coated lenses results in an impressive all-round optical performance with a sharp image and good contrast. The Emerald Compact SWAT has a mill dot reticle. It's a configuration I really like because it offers additional aiming points to compensate for wind and gravity without looking too cluttered or complicated. And the fast focus eyepiece means you can quickly get that reticle pin sharp with a twist of the ocular dial. The reticle can even be illuminated for improved contrast against dark backgrounds, which is really handy for dusk shooting and lamping. Operated by a dial on top of the eye bell, it turns with distinct stops to offer five levels of illumination in either red or green. The scope's price includes a set of two-piece mounts. When you get free mounts included with a scope, they aren't always the best but these ones are sturdy and seem to be very well engineered. I really can't find fault with them. The Emerald Compact's large push lock turrets make for very easy zeroing. Pull them out to unlock and they turn with clear stops. It's one quarter MOA adjustment, which means that each step amounts to one quarter of an inch zero shift at 100 yards. When you've got the scope zeroed at your chosen range, the turrets snap back down to lock in place. 
They lock down nice and tightly, but you can tell if they're unlocked because the button that stands proud of the turret when it's in the closed position appears to be flush with the top of the turret. The 3 to 12 times zoom range is a popular choice for general air gun shooting and gives plenty of versatility for hunting. 12 times magnification is plenty powerful enough for long range bipod work and the lower end of the scale at 3 to 5 or 6 times really helps to pull in the light when you're shooting in dim conditions. The chunky grooved zoom dial makes for fast and very positive adjustment. Parallax focusing is courtesy of a very smooth side wheel. It focuses right down to just 10 yards, which is very handy for backyard plinking and close range pest control. And of course, you can always add that oversized 100 mm side wheel and mark it with your own calibrations. This scope is covered by a no quibble replacement lifetime warranty. Combined with its impressive performance and those extras which include flip-up lens covers, two-piece mounts and the oversized parallax wheel, I reckon this little scope offers fantastic value for money, especially when you consider that the whole lot costs less than £150. That's all for this week, but we'll be back again in a fortnight. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you aren't already a member of the BASC, it's time you joined the organisation that works to promote and protect your sport.